Hi, I'm John Mark Young, President and Chief Investment Officer of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers. And I'd like to welcome you to another installment of the Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, what we learned in the markets this week video. Remember, our aim is to provide you, our valued clients, with a brief video giving you information that is helpful to your understanding of the markets from a biblical worldview with no financial agenda, which of course makes us uniquely different from the news media in America. As a reminder, this video is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon to make investment decisions. Clients of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers may maintain positions in the securities discussed on today's videos, and all opinions discussed are solely those of John Mark Young and not those of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers. So let's talk about the four things we learned in the markets this week, starting with point number one. And point number one was the stock market opened the month of May with a little bit of down and a little bit of up. And at the end of the week, there was pretty much a whole lot of nothing. I'll get to those results here in a second. However, before we do that, let's discuss some of the most important companies, or at least the most impressive earnings that were announced this week. Those that posted strong earnings for the week were Apple, who I'm actually going to take that whole earnings call and make that another point here in a second, but also were online used car seller Carvana, the cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase, and sports betting platform DraftKings. Now, those final three companies, again, Carvana, Coinbase, and DraftKings, they all surged on Friday. Their stock price did 24%, 18%, and 15% respectively after reporting very strong earnings. In addition, concert provider Live Nation had a great day Friday. They actually ended the day up 15%. And that was after they announced on their earnings call that they had incredible demand for live concerts. I think COVID is over. Each week, we look at the initial claims for unemployment insurance. And that rose to 242,000 this last week. That was a rise of 13,000, while economists had predicted the number would come in around 240,000. So right in line with what analysts were expecting. And finally for the week, the S&P 500, which is our proxy for growth and growth and in income, when taken together, that ended the week down 0.8%. The Russell 2000, which is our proxy for aggressive growth, smaller companies in our Dave Ramsey vernacular, that was down 0.43 for the week. And finally, the lone bright spot of the week was the MSCI EFA, which is our international proxy. And that was positive 0.35% for this week. Point number two, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released their highly anticipated monthly U.S. non-farms payroll number this week. Now, this number gives us a glimpse into how many jobs were created during last month, April in this case. And uh, the release was pretty good. The number came in higher than expected. The consensus among all economists was that we were going to get 185,000 new jobs for the month of April in 2023. But the actual number came in at 253,000. That's quite a beat. That sounds like really good. However, this video series is all about digging into those numbers and giving you the facts, good or bad. And while that number is very good, here's the not so good news about that number. First, in the report, we learned that the prior two months were revised down 149,000. And that's what they do in these reports is they also get more time to get the previous month's numbers and they, they make any revisions that need to be made to them. So those were revised down 149,000, bringing the new gain to a not so exciting 104,000 if you take the revisions off. Next, the unemployment rate ticked down to 3.4%. And this is the lowest level for that number since the 1950s, 3.4% unemployment. However, that more modest growth in employment, 104,000, as we described above, was also paired with a 43,000 decline in the labor force. So 104,000 net jobs added, 43,000 decline in the labor force. So some people are leaving the workforce, which is never a good sign for the economy because a strong economy needs a strong workforce. Now, don't get me wrong. The level of the U.S. employment situation is strong, and it's very easy to get a job right now, hence why the unemployment claims number we track each week hasn't been going haywire. However, what was discussed above is what we'll watch to see if there's any deterioration in the labor economy, which would be, in my point, the beginning of a recession. As I've discussed, in my opinion, you can't have a recession when you have a labor market that's so good. So the labor market is paramount right now to any recession. But my view is nothing imminent for a recession right now. Point number three, the consumer is not dead. That was one analyst reaction to the largest company in the world, Apple, 
And by the way, they're worth $2.7 trillion when they announced their first quarter earnings last week. Now, by the way, do you know who the second largest company in the world is? It's Microsoft at $2.3 trillion. And the third largest is a non-US company. It's Saudi Aramco at $2 trillion. Now, Apple was the last of the tech giants to report earnings for the quarter. And according to fact set analysts, they had expected Apple to come in at $92.9 billion in sales and $22.6 billion in net income. However, they beat those numbers. Their sales number came in at $94.8 billion, which was down 3% from a year earlier, but did beat analyst expectations. And their net income number came in at $24.2 billion, another 3% decline from a year earlier. The decline can largely be attributed to softer demand for Macs and iPads, those high dollar ticket items. However, the iPhone was the star of the show doing particularly well in one very important market for China or for Apple. Now, is that market China? Did I just slip? No, it's not China. Maybe I slipped on purpose. Not at all. It's India. Last month, Apple opened its first retail store in India, which could help accelerate iPhone sales for the entire year. In addition, they may be looking into India as a way to diversify their supply chain with their main manufacturing partner, Foxconn Technology Group. They're also considering a major expansion in India right now. Now back to the strong iPhone sales. These sales were very strong in emerging markets like India, like Indonesia, Lat many Latin American countries, many Middle Eastern countries. In total, iPhone sales were up 1.5%. Those were actually positive from a year earlier to 51.3 billion. So over half of their Apple sales are attributed to the global demand for the iPhone. And the fact that the average price for the iPhone continues to go up, now it averages $988. In the last quarter, it used to be $802 before the pandemic happened. That bodes well for their ability to grow their top line revenue. In addition, Apple boasted its dividend by 4% and agreed to repurchase $90 billion in stock. Now, I bring this company up because it's very important to each and every one of you as investors and Americans. Not only is it America's largest company, as we just discussed, but systematically very important to our economy. And you also have Apple as a major holding in your growth funds because it's still growing very fast, and your growth in income funds, because it's strong dividend. It's one of the few companies that actually sits in both categories in Dave Ramsey's land of the growth category and the growth and in income category. The, by the way, the other major company that sits in both categories uh, is Microsoft. They, they sit in both, in case you're wondering. Finally, in regards to Apple's uh, next month, they're going to have their developer conference. And it's widely expected at this conference, they're going to make a few announcements, the first of which is a new journaling app for users of iPhones to track their daily lives. And they think that'll be a big, pretty big hit. And something we've talked about on this video series before, their newest product in a decade will be a la launched, their newest a hard product, and that's a headset that will merge virtual and augmented reality into one device. Not expected to make a lot of money right away, but their newest product in a long time. And finally, point number four, the Federal Reserve concluded its May meeting this week and Fed President Jerome Powell did his normal press conference following that meeting. Now, in this meeting, they approved their 10th interest rate increase that now spans slightly longer than a year of rate hikes. However, he did hint that the rate hiking cycle is probably over. This took the Fed funds rate to a range of five to five and a quarter, and there was unanimous consensus among Fed presidents to take the rates to this level. Even though some analysts thought because of our banking issues we're having right now, that, and, and by the way, those are all brought along because of poor balance sheet management by these banks, not necessarily a true problem in our banking system, just poor management. Uh, but those were all because of the rapid rate hikes that the Fed just went through, that they actually should have paused their rate hiking cycle. They didn't unanimous. They wanted to raise it quarter percent. So that's what happened. And the uh, sentence that many individuals noticed that was no longer present in their commentary they put up was this sentence. The committee anticipates that some additional policy firming, which is short for rate hiking, may be appropriate for the Fed to achieve its 2% inflation goal. That is missing. That was no longer in the sentence. So hence what they're saying is they no longer think, need, think they need to keep raising rates to get inflation under control. Hence the thought our rate hiking cycle is over. But that's far from a guarantee that we'll be done uh, hiking rates. 
So one thing regarding the, the banking crisis that the Fed did note in their meeting was that it will create tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, and that will likely weigh on economic activity, hiring, and inflation. If businesses can't borrow because banks are forced to tighten because of the impacts of what happened to SVB, First Republic, and Signature Bank, then they won't lend, and that lending will slow down hiring, which will help kill inflation. As we know, and as we try to practice in our own lives, the borrower is slave to the lender. So if you do things at the speed of cash, you really don't have to worry about that. But most of society does use borrowing to expand their companies. So we'll see how all this plays out. A great rationale for your interest in this video series. One thing I should note, we're very excited to announce that in four to six weeks, four to six weeks, maybe a month or so, we'll be launching our first Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers app in the Apple App Store, in the Google Play Store, a Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers app. Now, what will this app do? Well, we'll talk about that more in future video series, but effectively the rationale for us wanting to create an app for our clients, for you, our value clients, is to merge a lot of the things that we think you wanna see into one great app. What are the things we think you wanna see? We think you wanna see your balances of any assets we help you manage, their perform respective performance. We think you wanna see your financial plan, those projections that we look at to see, are you on track for retirement? How much do we think you'll have saved for the, that goal and any other goals you might have? We also think that our, our content we create, whether it's the articles our advisors and coaches write or the video series like this that we create should be shown all on that app. So one app that shows you everything that has all your, your financial planning, retirement planning aspects all built into one is what we're trying to create. And our developer has said, four to six weeks is there now ETA on having that completed. So we're excited to launch that. We're excited for you to see that. We'll talk more about that in future video series. But thank you so much for watching this week's video series of what we learned in the markets this week. If you like this video series, would you do us a favor? If you like this video series, you can hit the like button. The like button helps us with Google and YouTube's algorithms and it helps push our content out to more people so we can help more people live and give like no one else, as well as hitting the subscribe button allows you to get content as we push it out in regular intervals immediately, which is so important. So you can be on the top of what's happening in the markets or our question of the week video series or any topical things that we do. As well as if you'd like to schedule a meeting with any of our financial coaches who help you in baby steps one, two, and three, get out of debt, stay out of debt, live on a budget and hold you accountable, you can click the link in the comment section as well as you can also schedule with any of our financial planners who will help you in baby steps four, five, and six so that you can work on a plan to start saving for retirement using your 401k, Roth IRAs, and any other vehicles you should be using get you a plan to help save for your kids college if that's applicable and a plan to pay off your house so that you can get to baby step seven where you get to live and give like no one else thanks so much we'll see you next week